guys and girls, welcome to the History of Infection. This time we're talking about polio. A 39-year-old American man is enjoying his vacation in Canada. On the 9th of August, he falls into some cold water while boating with his kids. Over the next two weeks, he begins to have a progression of worrying symptoms. The next day, he goes sailing again with his kids, and he does some jogging across a small island he sailed to. And that evening, he complains of back pain and starts to have chills, which continue throughout the night. The next day, he wakes up to find that one of his legs is becoming quite weak, and by evening time, it's paralysed. Along with this, the other leg starts to feel weak. His family doctor luckily is on hand and diagnoses him with a cold. The symptoms continue however to get worse and the family doctor knows of an eminent doctor vacationing luckily in the area. He's brought in and diagnoses a blood clot around the spine. By this time the man is paralysed from the chest down and can't pass urine and is sensitive to the touch. The eminent physician now suspects that there's a lesion around the spine and begins to try and treat for that. But by the 25th of August, a third doctor is brought on board and the group of them decide that in fact the patient has contracted polio. The patient recovers from the paralysis above the waist but is left paralysed below. Of course, this didn't really stop him from becoming the only man to ever be elected three times to the office of president in America. Of course, this patient was actually Franklin Roosevelt who contracted polio on holiday in Canada. Polio only seems to become a problem during the 20th century. It quickly became one of the most feared diseases in history as it seemed to target young and strong children. Polio is caused by a virus, and this means like all viruses, it can't be treated with antibiotics. Instead, you need some sort of antiviral or if you can, a vaccine. The polio vaccine was probably one of the best known vaccines until quite recently when things like MRR became more widespread. There's a common myth that the last outbreak of polio was caused by the polio vaccine. And anti-vax people tend to say, look, the vaccine is dangerous. It actually causes polio and the levels of polio are on the decline until the vaccine was introduced and it makes people sick and it's poisonous, it's deadly, we don't need it. And blah, 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 blah. So like all myths, there's a bit of truth to this, but let's try and get to the bottom of it sensibly. The polio vaccine once did cause an outbreak of polio. That is perfectly true, but this was caused due to a mistake in the production process of the vaccine. Furthermore, to say that the number of cases were going down is also kind of true, but that's only if you look at the death rates from polio, which whenever I see these things on websites, it's always the death rates, not the actual polio cases. This decrease is due to improved treatments like iron lung and people understanding that if you treat the actual symptoms caused by the polio, you can actually allow children to survive it. If they have their lungs compressed for them and a respirator applied, they don't die from lack of oxygen. And eventually their lungs do recover most times. So that's why there was a reduction in the death rate. Not because the polio was going down, but because we knew how to treat it better. The iron lung pictured here is one of the great moments in medical history where an idea might be just too basic to work. Simply put, the idea was that if a patient could have their respiration controlled for the whole time they were paralyzed, paralyzed, then the muscles work throughout might be able to regain their ability to be used once the virus had been defeated by the body's immune system. And this idea worked for the vast majority of people put into these machines. However, some children, unfortunately, did have to spend the remainder of their life on ventilation. Now, when we talk about the polio vaccine, there are actually two different kinds. The first was invented by Salks, and that's the inactivated polio vaccine, or IVP. And the oral polio vaccine. The inactivated polio vaccine uses partially destroyed virons uh, by using formalin, a chemical that essentially kills everything, even viruses which aren't technically alive. This is then injected into the bloodstream of the patient and this induces an antibody immunity response. And it was this vaccine that actually had the problem with its manufacturing process which led to an outbreak. The oral polio vaccine was a bit smarter on paper. This uses genetic engineering to alter the genetic code of the virus, effectively making it sterile. So in the UK and US, the inactivated polio vaccine is the current first choice we use. However, worldwide, it's much easier to use the oral polio vaccine as you can vaccinate many more people much quicker for polio just by giving them orally instead of having to inject them and making sure you know you have to have some sort of trained person to injection whereas just putting a drop on someone's tongue is much easier. Now you might think it's not ethical to give a less effective treatment to people in the developing world. Well it's not less effective necessarily but it's probably more dangerous. Ethically it's true that this is more dangerous however the problem is we have limited resources and the most cost-effective and life-saving option this is not just all about money. This is about how many lives you can save with the amount of money we have available to these groups doing this work is to use the slightly, and it really is only slightly more dangerous vaccine to immunize many more people and save more people. So the, the risk of people taking the vaccine is greatly outnumbered by the people 
who are receiving the vaccine and being saved by the vaccine. If the worst situation happened, more people would die from not having the vaccine than people who would ever die from getting the slightly more dangerous vaccine. However, it's my opinion that these groups have bigger concerns than the ethics of their work and the efficacy. In countries like Pakistan and across East Africa, misconceptions from religious slash political groups such as the Taliban have threatened the work of vaccination groups. There have been several cases of workers being killed by such groups in recent months, which is just plain sad. These people are just trying to bring vaccinations and a higher standard of life in a lot of senses to people who really require it and religious political motivations are getting in the way of people's safety and health. Polio could be eliminated if public effort and response was focused on it, but due to idiots who practice and sell misinformation for personal gain, public opinion is divided on about vaccinations. I wouldn't be surprised to see polio make a return to the UK shores in a few years if this trend of mistrust continues. If that day happens, many people will say, I told you so, but that won't stop innocent children dying from retarded people thinking that they are better informed than they are. It would be an event that future historians would no doubt overanalyze. Why did the eradication of polio stumble and fall at the very finishing line. We know we can eradicate diseases and we've done it before and we can do it again. So that's this episode of a History Infection. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, feel free to hit subscribe and like. If you have any comments, leave them below and I'll try to get back to you. Um, I hope you'll join me next time when I'll be discussing the rather long history of a now thankfully historical disease, smallpox. Thanks for watching.